Reporting from the White House here in Washington, D.C., to our viewers in the United States of America and across the world, I am Charles Ebune, and this is Globe Watch America. Tonight, roughly $1 trillion is lost by developing economies each year to illicit financial flows. It is one of the issues that the Obama administration, like many other American presidencies, are handling, making sure there is transparency in the global management of public and private transactions as world trade increasingly becomes important. So how far are governments across the world tackling the issue of illicit financial flows, which is considered a cancer, especially in developing countries where development is a major issue. My guest today is one of the most senior and authoritative voices in the business. Raymond Baker, welcome to Globe Watch. Thank you. Delighted to be with you. Roughly one trillion dollars disappear from developing countries through kickbacks, invoicing, and all other sorts of illicit financial flows you can imagine. And that amount equals direct overseas investments into those countries. How dangerous is that? I think it's destructive to the developing uh, world. Um, um, uh, indeed, our estimate of a trillion dollars a year is conservative because uh, that estimate is based entirely on data filed by governments with the IMF. That is, there are a lot of things that are not included in that data. Smuggling is not included in that uh, uh, data. Um, some forms of commercial activity that are illegal are not included in that data. So we think the figure is very uh, uh, conservative. Who takes responsibility for such uh, development destroying businesses, especially in the developing countries, name them Cameroon, name them Chad, name them Equatorial Guinea, name them Peru. There are three sources of illicit money corrupt, criminal, and commercial. The corrupt component is bribery and theft by government officials. The criminal component is drug trading and human trafficking and that sort of thing. The commercial component is uh, tax evasion by corporations. Now, for many years, uh, people were uh, suggesting that this problem is all about corruption in those developing countries. Um, in our estimation, the cross-border flow of this money, corruption is the smallest component. Criminal is next. By far the largest part of this uh, comes from commercial uh, tax evasion. Uh, so who's responsible for it? We're responsible for it. You're responsible for it. Uh, uh, this is a systemic issue uh, that we have not adequately uh, uh, addressed. Uh, between the richer and the developing countries. You, you said that it is a systemic issue. It is not only global financial integrity that talks about this issue we are talking about. We have heard about the Coffee Atan and reports stating that about $50 billion, this is specifically in Africa, leave the continent yearly lost to illicit financial businesses. And one stark blame is on Western multinationals who are blamed for sucking the resources through misvoicing and a lot of corruption in acquisition and award of contracts. This is a blame that Washington, Paris, London should take because they own the biggest multinationals across the world. Um, in our estimation, commercial tax evasion is the biggest part of it. And within that commercial tax evasion, um, we think that multinational corporations are probably the biggest part of that. We don't have data on that, but we think that that is probably the case, and particularly for Africa. Um, uh, one reason that we think uh, that the multinational corporations are the biggest part of the commercial aspect of this in Africa is because there is so much resource exports 
uh, going out, uh, generated through the mining activities of multinational corporations. Uh, resource exports are accounting for a considerable part of the illicit money that is flowing out of, uh, uh, out of Africa. You just produced a very damaging report on illicit financial flows, stating that it, out, it has outsized development efforts, and that this has been very, very dangerous in the development of the human capital and the infrastructural development of the continent. What is the correlation in these two areas? Globally, uh, our data indicates that there's more illicit money coming out of the developing world. Quoting the June 2015 report, the mm -hmm. latest you have. More coming out than the total of um, official development assistance going in and foreign direct investment. ODA and FDI going into the developing world. Um, we think that the same thing is true of Africa per se, not just the whole of the developing world, but Africa also. Africa is experiencing a greater outflow than the total amount of aid and FDI coming in to Africa. This makes no sense, not for Africa, not for the donor countries that are providing uh, uh, the money. You in Back, maybe many years ago, you wrote the book, which is in front of me, Capitalism's a Shields Hill, Dirty Money and How to Renew the Free Market System. And in that book, you say, in this book, that illicit financial flows are bleeding development efforts in Africa and in other parts of the world. What policy options are best for governments across the world to say goodbye to this cancer? The short answer to your question is transparency. Greater transparency in the global financial system. Almost all of this money flows through a shadow financial system that comprises tax havens and secrecy jurisdictions and disguised corporations and trade mis-invoicing, as you talked about, and money laundering techniques and so forth. This is a system that moves uh, all three kinds Who of that the West. It was established by uh, Western countries. And you know that if such a system is destroyed, Bank of America, Coca-Cola, Name all the big multinationals you can imagine. Uh, those managed by French businessmen, if um, uh, name is going off memory for the moment, Bolloré. You know that if sanity is put in such areas, poverty will rock America, poverty will rock Europe. Are, you, are they ready to clean their systems? I don't think it will hurt. I think it will help business. Think about it. The greater part of foreign direct investment. Can Swiss banks in particular unlock their secrecy laws, which of course makes Switzerland a tax haven, just like the Cayman Islands, just like many areas around the Pacific or Malta, where these billions and billions of dollars are stuck. This is an issue that the American government has been battling with the Swiss administration there are some countries that will have to make substantial adjustments. Uh, there are other countries and other companies that I think will profit greatly from this. I want you to understand something. The bulk of cross-border commercial activity goes from countries that have strong laws to countries that have strong laws. The United States to Europe or Europe to Japan or that sort. By far the greater part of foreign direct investment flows between strong economies. So when we talk about strengthening Africa's uh, legal framework, um, I think you're attracting investment to come into GAF because in, in the final analysis, most companies want to invest where they know that their investment is safe and secure and is in an environment that uh, uh, that operates legally. 
Now, that's not true of all companies. Some companies take advantage of the loopholes in the free market system, but not most. Most companies want to do business where the law is strong. So when we talk about strengthening uh, uh, the law in developing countries to curtail the illicit outflows, we are at the same time strengthening the legal framework for foreign investment uh, to come in to these countries. I think the global financial system will work much, much better for everyone with strong transparency measures in place rather than the weakness that we have at the present time. You founded um, Global Financial Integrity and it is less than a quarter of a century of existence. It is not up to 15 years of existence. I just wonder what you have done to help governments, to help institutions, and other policy-making uh, bureaucracies across the world to adequately address this issue? There are two aspects, uh, aspects to this. Number one, we had to get the issue on the table. We had to get it in people's thinking. Mm. The second step is to take uh, the positive measures that are necessary to curtail it. We have spent um, the nine years that we have been in existence. We were founded in, in 2006. We spent nine years getting the terminology, illicit financial flows, thoroughly into the thinking of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and the UN and the OECD and the developing countries uh, and so forth. And we have succeeded in doing that. The Financing for Development Conference, which just ended in Addis Ababa last month, adopted an outcome uh, statement that for the first time included illicit financial flows, the curtailment of illicit financial flows as a key commitment of the whole global community. So we've done step one. We've got the issue into everybody's thinking. What we have to do next is to work with governments to curtail these illicit financial flows, to put in place the transparency measures, the financial transparency measures that are necessary uh, to control this problem. You have been quoted by people like Hillary Clinton, the Democratic presidential hopeful for next year's presidential election here in the United States of America, a former UN Secretary General, Kofi Atan, and has quoted you and many others Apart from being quoted of the excellency of your work, do you have any other achievements to say, in about nine years, I have had an impact? We are working with a number of governments to curtail illicit financial flows. A number of governments in Africa, a number of governments in Latin America. We have um, uh, accomplished um, measures which are beginning to uh, curtail this money. That's the second step. How much money have you helped governments across the world to recover from these illicit financial flows? i just give you an example. India, for example, between March 2013 and March 2014, through your mechanism, succeeded to recover $400 million from such illicit financial flows. Can the Indian therapy be applied to other regions across the world? Let's distinguish between two things. The outflow of money and the recovery of the money that has already yeah, gone out. Like yeah. We don't work very hard on asset recovery, money that has already gone abroad. We don't work very hard on trying to recover it um, for a very specific reason, and as we think that it is an extraordinarily labor-intensive effort to, um, uh, to have any success there. Even the World Bank has done an analysis in which they estimate that less than 1% of money that has gone illegally abroad has ever been recovered back to the developing countries. So we don't work on that very much. Our, our position is it doesn't do very much good to try to recover money that has gone abroad if the, thing, if the same mechanisms exist in the country for that money to turn around and go back out again. 
No, the first thing to do is to put in place the mechanisms that curtail the outflow of illicit money. That's what we work on primarily. Let me just give you a quotation from uh, 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 Engel Guria, happens to be the Secretary General of the Organization of Economic uh, Cooperation and Development in, 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 in the European Union. He says, the issue of illicit financial flows is at the forefront of the international agenda. Governments worldwide are joint efforts to combat uh, money laundry, tax evasion, and international bribery, which make up the bulk of IFF. That is illicit financial flow. Do you have the impression, do you have the impression that governments, the international community, are cooperating enough and that they take this serious? I wouldn't say cooperating enough. I would say beginning to cooperate. There are particular elements of financial transparency that need to be put in place. Let me give you one example. Disguised corporations. Much of the illicit money that flows around the world is handled by corporations where nobody knows who owns the corporation. The, the ownership is disguised. Um, there are measures underway in the European Union and in the United States to address that reality, to require knowledge of who are the owners of businesses. This hasn't been completely implemented yet, but it's moving forward. Another uh, aspect of what we talk about is automatic exchange of tax information between countries. The United States has taken the lead in this. And the United States did so for its own purposes. That is to say, we wanted American money in foreign bank accounts to, uh, to be taxed. And so those foreign bank accounts were required to report to America uh, what those earnings were. Well, obviously, the foreign bank said, okay, we'll give you that information, but you give us the same information regarding citizens of our country that have money in your account. This automatic exchange of tax information across borders is progressing. I know that across the world, honest people, people who seek transparency, people who seek accountability, people who seek honest business are targets of personal traits, are people that the society generally hates because whether we like it or not, society largely in most cases does not like people who are transparent. What has been your most challenging task in making the international business environment clean for everybody? I would say the most challenging task that we've had and still have is making it clear that all three forms of illicit money, corrupt, criminal, and commercial, use exactly the same processes, use exactly the same shadow financial system um, uh, to move through the world. And the reason that that's important is because uh, in many cases in the Western world, we think that we can hold on to use of the shadow financial system to move tax evading money while at the same time making others give up their use of the system to move corrupt and, and criminal huge, money. Just hang on, Mr. Baker. You have huge experiences, especially in the international business environment. You were an entrepreneur. Today turned a, a, a Mr. Clean or a Mr. Cleaner of the world. When you were doing businesses, were you involved in illicit financial flows? Did it benefit you? And then you have realized, that, okay, today I've had enough money. I can give a damn and clean. The system. In my business activities, I had the reputation of... Are you sure that if you're in front of Jesus, you are giving to me? I would provide the same answer that I'm giving to you. There was an occasion when a law enforcement officer was trying to intimidate me, and I had to get rid of that intimidation. How? Um... I took whatever steps were necessary to remove that intimidation. Including corruption? Um, I don't know whether you would call it uh, corruption or not, because the U.S. Congress has defined um, uh, corruption 
as anything above $800 or $1,000. Uh, anything else was uh, identified as a facilitation payment. That's still the law in the United States. Let's move towards the end of the interview. You have a very long tradition of dealing with African communities. When you watch Africa today, it is called by many as the future of the world. Barack Obama just returned from the African Union and made very lousy, promising statements. Let the administration, forgive me for using such an expression, because it, it can be interpreted somewhere as lacking respect for an American president. I don't intend to do that. What strikes you most about Africa today? Security, economic development, or? Economic development. Africa is booming. You are not worried by the current trends in Nigeria, Cameroon, um, Kenya, and many others where terrorism is increasingly having a grip on these countries. I am very concerned about violence and about uh, um, um, uh, extremist groups. I'm very concerned about that. I know the area where this is taking place. Uh, in northern Nigeria and in northern Cameroon. I know that area. I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about it in Mali and uh, uh, concerned about it in East Africa and so forth. But offsetting that has been a tremendous rate of economic growth that I think is, is, is the greater story, is the most encouraging story. Um, and I think that's where we should, we should uh, uh, envision Africa moving in the, uh, in the years to come. Much of what you and I have been talking, illicit financial flows, this is the business of those in the corridors of power. And the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, who happens to be guest on this program, Carlos Lopez, confirmed that to me, who sits on the same table with you on the... African Union BAT uh, panel on illicit financial flows with Akere Muna, Tabo, Mbeki, and others. Is it easy for you guys to coach people who are in the corridors of power? Uh, it's perfectly easy for us to draw attention to the problems we're talking about. By far, as the greater challenge is to get those problems acted upon, to get the solutions acted upon. That is the challenge going forward. And as a matter of fact, um, the, the first steps of the high-level panel will be taken next month in East Africa, beginning to work toward implementation of the recommendations that are made in the high-level panel report. We know there's a lot of work to do, but we're also finding a lot of um, uh, desire in Africa to move forward uh, with solutions. GFI continues to work with that. Uh, others uh, do as well. We, we see forward progress. Um, of course, it's easy to, uh, uh, to say, oh, the problem is too big to be solved. I don't agree with that. Uh, we've made progress and we will continue to make progress. The president of Global Financial Integrity, Raymond Baker, on that note, I'm afraid we have to end here. Thanks very much indeed. It's been my pleasure and Accepting our invitation. At your head office here in Washington, D.C. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure.